Eric, your first experience, your first time that you saw an aircraft, do you remember it? Yes. I was about um, 12 and uh, I used to cycle to Elmden, which was then, it's now Birmingham Airport. And it was just a field with a fence around it and we kids used to cycle up there and lean on the fence and watch the little biplanes fly, flying from there. What, what did you think about it? What, what, what were your impressions when you saw that? Well, I suppose some, some youngsters want to be train drivers. But I always wanted to um, fly in one of those things. It seemed very, uh, uh, quite a thrilling uh, adventure to me. And... Uh, I never lost that urge to fly. Now, before you joined the Air Force, did you ever get any chance to go in, a, go in an aircraft? No, no. I, um, I never had the chance of flying until um, I joined the Air Force, of course. Um, can I tell you how I joined the Air Force? You can, but can I, can I do that one next? I was actually going to ask you that okay. one. But the one question I wanted to ask you, um, do you, did you enlist or were you called up? No, I enlisted. And I'll tell you how that happened. It's quite interesting. I was 19, and at 19, most youths are always out with the girls. And I was out with a young lady. Oh, all my friends around, I lived in Bourneville, all my friends in Bourneville were getting their call-up papers. So I knew that my turn would be coming up before long. And I was out with um, a young lady from uh, Billsley, near uh, Acox Green in Birmingham. And I was saying I didn't, I, they, all my friends were getting called up for the army and the navy, I didn't want to go in those. And um, she said, well, you go and see my, my dad. He's a, he's a recruiting officer at Dale End in Birmingham. And he'll put you right, tell him you're my boyfriend. So the next morning I was down at Dale End there, cycled down to uh, Dale End, saw her father and um, can't remember her name now unfortunately. And he said, um, what would you like to be? He said, would you like to be a pilot in the Air Force? And I said, yes, of course, yes. So he gave me all my official papers and said, take these down to the RAF recruiting officer and uh, you go from there. So that's what I did. I went down there, saw this chappy and um, he put me down for uh, strict medical examinations and uh, I'd got my trick, of course. Um, and uh, I was accepted as uh, a trainee pilot. Did you have any problems getting accepted? Were there any issues, health issues or problems? No issues at all. And it was a very... I had about three or four medical exams. It was very, very strict. They weren't worried about me, but they didn't want the, the aeroplane smashed up. Um, and so, yes, I passed, passed that okay. I got my, uh, as I say, I got the matric, which was a, a certain amount of uh, um, academic side of it. Uh, and yes, I was, I was accepted. How did your parents file, find out and how did they feel when, when, you, when you told them that you had joined? Well, I was quite thrilled about it. I don't think my parents were very, very happy. But um, um, I was uh, sent, to, I went down to Cardington and I had three days there with medicals. Um, it was a very, very strict medical. Um, 
And then they sent me home until they'd got a, a vacancy for me on the course. And so I came home. I did a few weeks at uh, the Austin Shadow Factory in Rednall, Longbridge. Um, and then uh, they'd got a place for me in about three or four months. And I went down to uh, Paynton. Remember, this was 1939, 1940, and everything was um, not very well organised or, or very new. I went, they put me in a hotel in Paynton on the front, the Palace Hotel, I always remember that. And uh, it was sheer luxury to me. I had a bedroom to myself and uh, the food was quite good. And um, there I did my, what we call the square bashing. That's learning to walk and um, salute in due course and whatnot. Um, and I had about uh, two months there, which was very nice. Then I was moved on to uh, beginning to uh, the flying um, course. I was posted to Mia, near Stoke-on-Trent. Um, I was flying uh, little magisters. Um, they were quite slow, and but still, they were good training aircraft. Um, well, I'm going to ask you about that because the was that the first time you ever what was the first time you ever experienced being in a plane then? That was the first one. I was an instructor and you had to fly solo in nine hours, else you went, you were thrown off the course. I managed to get through in seven hours uh, before I did my first solo. Um, but was, was, what was that experience like? Was it, was it everything you thought it would be? It was and more. I was scared. <laughs> it's all right getting off, it's getting back down. Um, well, can you talk me through that? Can you talk me through your first experience of a flight? Well, I'd done my uh, seven hours with an instructor. And he said, OK, carry on. Cool. I didn't know what to do. I uh, hadn't got the foggiest idea. But I got no choice. I'd got to do it. There, the instructor there. And strangely enough, in the Magister, he used flaps for landing and t uh, take off. Not take off, landing. And there's a little lever in there that you have to, when you've landed, you have to pull your flaps up, you see. Well, I jumped into this aircraft and it's a drill that when you're taking off, you check all your flaps and your um, mixture and all the rest of it. A whole lot of things to check before you start to take off. Well, I was a bit new and I, I, I'm sure I'll pull the flaps back, flaps lever, but I didn't pull it back fully, and then I took off. And of course, with the flaps down, trying to take off, I could barely get to flying speed, and it wouldn't lift. And I took off. It did manage to get off the ground, but there were some houses at the end of the runway, I always remember. And I must have missed those by not more than six inches. I just, just cleared the top of the houses. And um, of course I realised what I'd done and I put it right Then eventually I landed and I got a jolly good telling off by the instructor. He says, I watched you, I thought you'd kill yourself. 
And uh, that was my first flying. Taught me a lesson though, never did it again. Do you remember if any of the instructors that you had, did any of them ever give you any advice that stuck with you throughout your career? Advice in flying, yes. Yeah. I'll, give, I'll give you an example of why. Well, I was talking to a, a, a fighter pilot in America, and he said that one of the pieces of advice he had was that when you're just about to shoot an aircraft down, look over your shoulder because there's going to be some. That's true, there that's waiting. true. And, that, and it saved he his was life. a bait, the one in the yeah, front. It saved his life because he did, and he saw there was a guy just lining up a shot on him. Yes, that's right. I'm just true. trying to think, was there any advice that you had that maybe stuck with you that. That was standard advice, but you soon got to realise it was very important to remember that advice as well. It was an old trick, and um, unfortunately, it, the chaps that got shot down, I mean, it didn't last long anyway. I think the average time for a fighter pilot was about 10 minutes. But it was always a new lad that got, the, got it, and The more hours you could get in, the more you uh, got to know these pitfalls and, and death traps that were set for you. Try to miss them. Okay, so look, you're in training. Were there any times during your training, apart from the flaps incident, where you were worried that you might not succeed, where you might wash out or you were there any other mistakes that you remember that you made, or any incidents in training? <laughs> yes, there were several. Uh, I never wanted to stop flying. I was determined to get through there. And um, when the others were going on leave at weekends or the days off, I'd stay behind and get one of the instructors to have a bit more time with me, give me some of the tips that was uh, uh, the little trips, t uh, tricks that you could use. Um, and because of that, when I passed out, I've got above average stamped on my log book. Um, so yes, it did me. I think it probably saved my life because I knew I wasn't quite a rookie when I went onto my squadron. I'd had a few, a few hours with an instructor, um, knowing what I should do and what I shouldn't do. Um, with regard to. smashing aircraft, um, from Mir on Magister's, I went up to um, Osworth in Northumberland, near Newcastle. And I was flying Hearts and Ordaxes. Now they're biplanes that were used in the First World War and you can tell how bad things were. I'm talking about 1940 now. These hearts and ordaxes were, they had two machine guns, one each side, which you had to cut manually, had to cut them manually. And the instructor said, if the Battle of Britain gets any worse, you've got to go into action with these. So you better get to know them pretty well. Um, luckily, I never went into battle with um, with these hearts and ordaxes, but we wouldn't have lasted a few seconds. Um, and I do remember on that, um, they were they're quite difficult to, to, to fly actually. I do remember I, I came into land one day and I knocked the power off and all the uh, um, pitch and all the rest of it, whole rigmarole. 
and this damn thing wouldn't sit down. It was just keeping above stalling speed. And it went down the runway. I couldn't get it down. Tried putting it on the deck, it wouldn't go. And eventually, I just knocked all the switches off, the magneto switches. Quickly, it all done in microseconds, yes. And it went off the end of the runway, dashed up onto, the, onto his nose, smashed the propeller, and uh, luckily no one was in, injured. And that was my first tiff on an aircraft. Um, but we all had these sort of things. It was one of those things that every, every they used to say, you weren't a good pilot till you smashed five. Well, I, <laughs> I managed to smash five. So um, um, I've had my share of aircraft smashes. <laughs> Were any of, them, um, any of the smashes that you had of um, a more serious nature? Did you have... Um yeah, were any more scary or more near loss of life sort of standard? Yes. I, the worst one, I'd been in Russia f flying with the, with the Russians, came back on, on Hurricanes, and I came back to England and we were changing onto Spitfires. And uh, I'd been flying Spitfires for a fair old time at Houston. That's also near, but that was an operational drone now. Uh, that, that's near Newcastle. And something that even today I can't, it upsets me, but um, they used to have a lot of labourer chaps working on the drone, doing digging trenches and all maintenance on the drone. And there used to be a, a, a coach bring them, and that stood by the control tower. And then they disappear all over the drone, doing whatever they got to do. Well, on this partic particular occasion, I don't know whether you, you know, but in a Spitfire, you've got about an 18-foot bonnet in front of you. You can't see a thing straight forward, unless you're flying, of course. But when you're coming into land, the reason the Spitfire comes in on a bend, it's not because he's showing off like that. It's because you can't see ahead of you, you look between the cowling and the wing, just in that little square. You come round until you see the runway in front of you like that. When you think you're lined up with the runway, then then you can straighten up, straighten up and keep on and you should hit the runway. Well, on this particular occasion, if they missed this coach that was at the control tower, then they had a long journey home. You know, quite a job getting back home. And of course, it's about three miles around, a, around the half of the run of the aerodrome. There was about, well, there was four laborers trying to run across the, across the aerodrome. Now that was forbidden, but that was one way they could do it. Get back to the bus before it went. Well, <clears throat> these four labourers got onto the runway, and of course I couldn't see them coming into control, into, <clears throat> in, in the approach because they hadn't started to run then. But once I'd straightened up, that's when they started to run across. I couldn't see them. And um, the moment I was touching down, I'd straightened up and I could see these four 
in front of me. There wasn't a thing I could do, like, I'd give it full aileron and full left rudder and it went up onto its wing tip and then onto its nose and eventually turned over and smashed, completely smashed the speech file up. <coughs> and um, they got me out anyway. I was touching go with it, went on fire. They were spraying it everywhere with stuff. They got me out and it, I was in hospital for about, oh, I don't know, four or five weeks. But I was all right. But I missed three of them, but I did catch the one. Um, killed him, of course. But that was the worst plane I plane crash I've ever had, and um, it affected me for um, several years afterwards. I used to scream at night and get out of bed and scream, and that sort of thing. that was a, a really bad one. Okay. Well, yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. We'll move away from that. Again. Yes, please. No problem. Um, Okay, so look, you, we'll go back to training then. So you're going through training, and do you remember, I'm not saying you have to list every aircraft, but you were saying about the, the Arts and the, and the Magisters. Do you remember any other aircraft you trained in? Uh, Arts, or Axis, I went on to. No, I went straight on to Hurricanes then. They wounded us badly. Wow. Okay. So when you were doing your training then, um, how did it feel? Let to me you? think. Yeah, that's right. I did go on to Oregon's. I know there's defiance in there somewhere. So, but we'll, we'll come to defiance in a minute. <laughs> but, um, when you passed, when you when you qualified, when you got your wings, how did it feel? <laughs> it was great. It really was super. It. Um, it was the height of achievement to a young kid like me. Don't forget I was only 20, 21. And uh, you were never short of young ladies to, for, baiting, uh, for dating if you got your wings on. If you got to a dance, you wouldn't be short of young ladies coming to ask you for dancing and whatnot, you know. It was nice. We felt good. After you passed your training and got your wings, um, where, what happened to you then? Where did you go from there? From wings, I went... I suppose it was because I'd got above average on my logbook. I was posted to... 615 Squadron, which was a Battle of Britain squadron. They were down in the south there on, the, um, oh, I forget the name of the airfield now. One of the, the Battle of Britain airfields. I was posted to 615, and that was Churchill's squadron. Churchill's own squadron, that was. It was, it was a, you know, considered a prestige sort of place. Anyway, they'd lost all their pilots. By the time I got down to them, they'd lost all the pilots and they were reforming and moved to Valley in North Wales uh, for re recoup and re reforming. And I was uh, then flying Hurricanes with 615 and I was defence of uh, the Midlands, um, North Wales, Liverpool, Manchester and all that sort of thing. And then one day, um, the CO sent for me and said, you've got a report to uh, Nottingham for an eye test. Well, uh, I made a good pal of uh, uh, a chap I admired very much. He was, he was a good pilot too. And we knew what this was. It was going to be night flying and nobody liked night flying. 
we didn't want to go night flying. So um, we went to this place at Nottingham and we sat in a, a dark room for about six hours. And then they showed silhouettes of uh, battleships and aircraft and very, very click glim, uh, dim. You could hardly see them. And you had to write down what they were. Well, we were, dis we were determined not to pass this exam. So we were, both of us were putting stupid answers on the thing, battleships for aircraft and all that. And we were having a chuckle on the way back. Well, that should have fixed them. They won't want us. <laughs> anyway, about four days after we got back, um, the CO sent forth. He said, well, lads, you pass your test all right. You're on night flying. <laughs> and I was transferred to, on the same drum, on Valley, they were flying Defiance, uh, all painted black and night fighting over Manchester. Oh, it was awful. And in those days, I'm talking about 1941 now, things were so bad that I'd be flying hurricanes with 615 in the daytime. And if there was a raid on over Manchester or Liverpool, I'd be flying Defiance at night. Um, it was terrible. And I hated the blooming things. They were underpowered. You'd got a gunner in a turret in the back. And um, you hadn't got a dog's chance. You'd got four machine guns against a 109 that got about eight cannons in the thing. You hadn't got a dog's chance. You couldn't even get near him. But uh, at night, on night flying, you could see the exhausts. I couldn't do anything about that. Um, and the only way you, you hoped to do any good with him was get behind him, hoping he hadn't seen you out of cloud or something, and have a pot at him. Because if you come to a straight dogfight, you were going to lose. There was no question about that. Um, so that's what it, how it was. It was um, it was um, night flying on on the defiance and uh, hurricanes in the daytime. Well, can you tell me your first first impressions of the hurricane? Well, I've flown hurricanes and Spitfires, and um, I liked the hurricane. I thought it was a nice aircraft. Um, take a lot of punishment, and um, it wasn't as fast as the 109, I know, but uh, um, if I had two on the lawn and said choose which you want, I would choose a hurricane for, for normal flying. But um, of course the Spitfire is a is a better gun platform. If I was going to fight somebody, I'd, I'd speak of Spitfire. It's faster. And uh, uh, yes, yeah, so I'd say it's a bit more maneuverable as well, quicker. But why would you prefer the Hurricane? It's a, it's a lovely, it's a bit bigger than the, a little bit round you and you, you feel part of the aircraft, you know. And um, it's very responsive. I like the Hurricane. Um, I don't know, you get to trust one or another. Spitfire, you've got to be a better pilot. If you... Um, if you're not careful, it'll turn around and bite you. Um, there's a few things you can't do with a Spitfire, or shouldn't do. And um, so there you are. I like both of them, but you asked me which one I'd prefer. Okay. Can you tell me 
Because like I said, I read the stories, okay, but can you tell me about when you went out practice flying and testing the hurricane over the sea? Over the sea? <clears throat> I do indeed. Under Defiant, incidentally, if it was a raid over Liverpool, we'd take off. <coughs> of course, you had a gunner in the back with a gun turret and whatnot. We'd take off and um, we'd be patrolling around trying to get these uh, bombers and you'd be running out of petrol. So you'd ring up base and say, um, short of petrol, want the landing lights on at Valley. And they'd say, oh, sorry, there's a raid still on at Liverpool. You, we can't put lights on. Come back in a few minutes. So come back in 10 minutes and say, um, uh, getting short of petrol, must have, must have landing lights. They'd say, no, raid's still on. And they'd come back a few seconds later, say, mayday, mayday. And they still wouldn't let you. They'd say, fly out into the, into the Irish Sea and bail out. Well, bailing out in, in February in the North Sea, they'd never find you. And it's bloody cold. Um, but that was their instructions. And then the last breath of petrol they'd put the lights on and you'd see aircraft coming in from all directions. <laughs> Free for all that was getting down. Now I read about you taking the hurricane over, out into the sea and you were sort of firing the guns and the noise and everything. Can you tell me about that? Well, very similar thing. And there's a, a phenomena flying over the sea. You can't tell which is the sky and which is the sea if you've got no uh, um, reference things to look at, the sky blends into the sea. And you've got to be um, a much better instrument flyer. No end of aircraft flew straight into the sea because they were flying on the seat of the pants, we used to call it, what they thought was level. You can never trust your feelings. They fly straight into the sea. And it's... Um, it's much more wearing flying over the sea. Unless it's a nice day, of course, uh, you know, plenty of cloud and that sort of thing. But certainly days when it's misty, a dull day, um, it's not pleasant at all. Um, one of your best friends was Johnny. What was Johnny's? Johnny Mulroy, yeah. Johnny Mulroy. Um, it says he used to practice dogfighting with him. Yeah, that's was one of the things we would... Well, that was one of the parts of the, the test. They, that was a nice part of flying before we joined a squadron. In the training, it was good fun and um, some of the happiest days of my life. Uh, they sent two of us up, you see, uh, and there was dogfighting. Well, that, and the cameras, of course, on the wings. Incidentally, you had cameras. Every time you fired your guns, you had the, there was a camera in the wing. No good you coming back and saying, I've shot three down, because they'd say, they put the camera. Well, it didn't say that on the camera, you know. So um, they'd, um, they'd send you up with your, with your pal, and you'd... You'd try and shoot, you know, with a camera, you'd try and shoot him down. And then it would be shown in the, um, in the instruction hall later on, and they'd point out where you should have been if you fired too quickly, if you, you waited too long and it was no point in firing, all that sort of thing. Very good, very good. And you've got to... You see, your guns were pointing... I had eight machine guns firing a thousand rounds a minute each gun. That's a lot of a lot of firepower. And you could have uh, incendiary every tenth one or 
armour piercing, every tenth one or anything like that. And it was all brought together or, I, or brought into a, a target, six foot target at 200 yards. That was where all, the, all, the, all your machine guns were focused on, 200 yards ahead into a six, six foot thing, you see. So you, you, the aim was to get within 200 yards of whatever you're shooting at. And that would give you the maximum um, effectiveness on your target. Did you ever manage to shoot Johnny Dane? <clears throat> Him. <laughs> um, I, I don't you, know. I wonder if you score between the two of you, you know, like if you saw yourself on cameras and everything, and you went, oh, I got you that time. I wonder if there was any of that. Oh, I see. We've been in training. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, um, you do that at least two or three times in, in an hour's exercise and you'd learn from it and say, well, I won't do that again. We had a trick of um, fighter lads used to, um, <clears throat> you can use your controls so that you look as if you're going forwards, but you're not, you're sliding away. Not forward, but sideways. That was a favourite trick. If you were, had somebody on your tail, you'd give it this sl sliding, uh, and he'd be thinking you were going straight ahead and you'd slide it away like that. It was a very effective manoeuvre to get out of trouble. You'd practise that quite a lot and see if you could if it was any good, he knew what you were going to do, and it's great for you. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to move on a little bit further now. Okay, so you, you've, you, you're on the 615 now. If you remember this date, great. If you don't, I'll tell you what it was. Do you remember July the 25th, 1941, um, when you were at your father's house? Yeah. Do you remember what happened? Oh, we'd got a bit of, of uh, um, bit of leave. We'd had no leave because Jerry was raiding that that part of the world, you know, every day almost, well, either in Manchester or Liverpool or Birmingham. So we didn't get any leave, and then we got a bit of leave, and um, I'd got an old Morris Twelve. My dad had bought, bought me. And um, I'd, I'd had about two days with my parents and a policeman came to the door and said, um, you have to report back to your squadron immediately. Marvellous. So we waited about a couple of three days and then we, had a, we thought it was, <laughs> we'd better get back there. But... Um, yeah, I think I've still got the telegram about that. Wow. So you, you get back to base. Um, how do you remember how eighty one squadron was formed, or how you joined eighty one? Yes, I do indeed. Because it was all top secret. Um, one day with six one five, we were told Johnny Mulroy and myself were told to report to. Um, near Hull, um, Leckenfield, which is near Hull. Now, we hadn't got the foggiest idea what, what, uh, what it was for or why they were sending us. Anyway, we, we got over to uh, Leckenfield and um, when we got there, there was 38 pilots from various squadrons separated from the rest of the aerodrome and 500 ground staff. We weren't allowed to send letters home, we weren't allowed to ring home. Um, nobody knew where we were going. It was absolutely top secret. And um, there was rumours going, uh, well, there were more than rumours. Um, we were told we were going to the Middle East. We were kitted out for the Middle East. 
all the shorts and everything. So we thought, oh, well, that must be where we're going. So at the same time, we thought, we, we, you know, we wanted our family, we weren't allowed to sell our families or anything. And then one dark night, we were stuck on the train at the uh, hall. All the windows blacked out, so we couldn't see out or couldn't, nobody could see us. And whipped across to Liverpool, straight on to Lansteffen Castle, which was a, was a luxury liner. And uh, when we got about two days out from Liverpool, the captain came on and said, you can throw your Middle East kit overboard because you're not going there, you're going to Russia. And that was the first we knew about it. And incidentally, the whole time we were there, we were not allowed any mail. We never sent any, we couldn't send any mail. Uh, we, my parents were going berserk because it's just as if we disappeared off the face of the earth. Nobody knew where we were. I know I'm coming back. My parents have sent me a, a cake. And I don't know where it had been, but they gave it to us on, on the ship coming back. And when I opened it, it was all maggots. It had been on this blooming boat for 12 months. <laughs> it was animal. Okay, well, look, can, you remember, can you remember what the conditions were like on the boat? Coming back? No, on, on when you were going. Can you remember what the conditions oh, were like? Oh, yes, going. They were, it was a luxury ship, Lansteffen Castle. Um, it had not been uh, altered for troop carrying, and I had a cabin to myself, and uh, uh, the food was absolutely superb. They'd got everything on board that you know, we hadn't seen in England for months, you know, and it really was very, very nice. Yes, we had a good, good trip out there. Um, it was soon to end when we got to Russia, but. Um, uh, it was quite a good trip, that. What? Did, did you see any other ships or any other sign of life at sea while you were out? Yes, we had an escort with us. Um, HMS Electra, uh, HMS Sheffield, um, Kenya. I'm trying to think of... Uh, Electra, we had a lot to do with Electra. Um, uh, luckily for us, the U-boat, there was hundreds of U-boats in that passage. The next one to us, um, next convoy to us, there was only 10 got through out of 35 ships. All the rest were shot, sunk. Trying to get into Mamansk, you see. Um, so we were very lucky, very lucky getting there. We went into Archangel and um, the, it was the biggest ship that had ever gone into uh, the docks at Archangel and we couldn't get near the quay to get, you know, disembarked. And within 24 hours, they got thousands of these Russian labourers had built a platform out, like a pier, out the side of the ship. It was fantastic. What was your first impression of, of Russia when you got there, when you arrived on the boat? <laughs> well, the first impressions were not too good. Um, our un uniforms were very similar to the Germans and they thought we were German prisoners of war. And of course, and, and at that time, the Germans were just running all over Russia. They were doing 200 miles a day into Russia. And, um, <coughs> but they soon got to know us. Uh, we weren't allowed to mix with them. If we went into a restaurant, it was very rare we did, but we went into a restaurant in uh, Mamansk. Um, 
the police would come and move everybody else out. No, no question about it. They just tell the others to leave what they'd got on the table and out, so that we couldn't mix with them. And uh, I was, what I was looking at there was when you actually arrived on the boat. I read in the book about the fact that you you were looking at like piles of wood and being shot at. Can you tell me that story? You were just saying you, you saw lots of wood, everything was stripped, and about you being sh you got shot at. Uh, yes, this was on the ship. You mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was because I, as I've just said, they thought we were German prisoners of war. One of the lads had had his arm shot. Because they were shooting from the from the shore, you see, from the side of the quay. I thought we were prisoners of war. So, you arrive, you arrive at the docks. Where's the first place that you go once you dis where, Where's the first base or area you go to after you leave the ship? Went to uh, Archangel, and all our hurricanes were in crates in the bottom of the ship. They were all got uh, on ashore and they were assembled in, Ar in Archangel. And then um, we had to fly them then. If you look at the map, we had to fly them over the full length of the White Sea up into um, the Kola Peninsula, up to uh, Mamansk. And the um, airfield there, which was called Vyanga. And uh, there again, 300 miles was about the limit of the Hurricane's range. And everything had been stripped off the Hurricane, all the guns and ammunition and everything, uh, to give, her, give us the maximum um, range for the thing and going over the um, White Sea you'd get ships firing at us um, because they were they didn't think it would be any um, Ru any Russian or British aircraft there they thought we were Germans you see and then you'd have to fire off the very pistols the colour of the day and uh, that would quieten them down a bit then. Um, but, it, it, you know, it wasn't a picnic. Would, um, uh, luckily, we got there without... We did land at one... I've forgotten the name of the airport. Uh, on the way to, Vi to uh, Vianga. But we got to Vianga without any serious troubles. Um, and strangely enough, some of our lads had flown off an aircraft carrier called the Argus. And that was... Um, anyway, they'd landed at uh, Vianga a little while before us. And they, the 109s had raided the drone. There was a hell of a fight going on. And we hadn't got a gun between us, you know. And luckily for us, I must have thought we were reinforcements coming. They just beetled off. But if they had known, they could have shut us all down before we even landed. Um, that was our first impressions. Then the drone was all mud and waterlogged. I think one or two lost their propellers because they got bugged down. Um, can you describe the base a little bit for me? Can you tell me what... You know, imagine if you can remember that you were on the base. What was it, like a large base? Was it mainly snow? Was it... You know, I know you said there was mud, but what... What was the base actually like from your memory? Well, it's a, it's a good question. I, from the air, when we first came onto it, I thought it was a lake. It was just like a big frozen lake. 
You could see little tufts of grass coming through here and there, but it was just frozen. Um, but in actual fact, it was a, a field that, that was covered with waterlogged and frozen, and it was just a big icy patch. That's all it was. And uh, you got to be very, very careful where you were landing, else you were up on your nose, you know. But um, we managed it all right. It was an interesting landing on it. Bloody dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking, because it was icy and frozen and waterlogged, was... Um, did you have, was it a longer runway or was it just still the same size? Runway? Longer runway, it was just a fail. Um, I can't, I, I think two of them lost their undercarriages. Yes, they did, that's right. Two lost their undercarts. But that was the only trouble. And um, they were soon repaired anyway. That's what I was going to ask you about that because one of the stories I read was about I think the first two hurricanes that arrived, the Russians. I'm not saying they hadn't seen them, but apparently the first two hurricanes that landed actually crash landed. That's right. And I said it wasn't a very good impression. <laughs> no, that's right. It was. It wasn't the pilot's fault. Poor old pilots always used to get blamed. It wasn't their fault. It was like landing on a muddy patch. And if your wheels dug in too much, you just went onto your nose and, you know, ruins your propeller. So when you arrive at the base, what happens then? What happens for you and what happens to the aircraft? Uh, well, of course, we were straight... Vianga was being raided every day by the, the Germans because they're only... Only about 10 miles away, they had air, air feet. when they were doing their circuit and bumps, they are almost in our circuit. Only 10 miles away. And we did, we have got um, German memos where the, the, they were, uh, the general in charge of that area was asking for a few more tanks to just run over us. But Hitler wouldn't let him have any more tanks. He said he wanted them for somewhere else. Luckily for us, because um, one of our favourite tricks at night, we'd have a big map on the floor and we knew our range and we were seeing where we could get to if German was on the edge of the drone. You know, we've got a pair of compasses where we thought we might get to. But of course, he, he, Norway was occupied by the Germans anyway, so... Um, he hadn't got much chance. <laughs> but it was better than staying. A bit later on, when we were coming home, I was... They, I managed to get onto a destroyer cruiser called HMS Kenya. And uh, we paired up with uh, about four Russian destroyers and we sailed along the coast from Vyanga and there was a port called Petsamo just a bit further. Now I'm not sure whether that was in Finland or Norway. Could be an argument about that. But we sailed into there because they were refueling and maintenance on German submarines. We're sinking our ships at sea, you see. We went in there and blew the place to bits. It was horrible. Um, if you imagine Land No Bay, and we sailed into there, middle of the night, we had these star shells up. You could see like daylight, you know. We sailed into there, very quietly, and then we opened up, and, and Kenya itself put 360 six-inch shells, which was, a six-inch shell is a big thing, you know, from out the window, that big. 
We put that into the coast of Pitsamo at close quarters. It obliterated the pits. I mean, you could see cars going up in somersault and in the air and all. I'd love to know if anybody goes there, whether it's been rebuilt or how many, if there was anybody killed or whatever happened to it. But when we sailed, we, it was all done while we were sailing, you know, under, under power. And then the Russian uh, cruisers all sailed in and did the same as they were going around. And I know there was a jetty coming out with a German submarine by the side of it. And we sent all our torpedoes in. And the, this jetty and the submarine went up like matchwood. It was a terrific sight. And uh, by then the shells were coming back Whizzing over there, just over the top of us. We <laughs> got out of it, got back to England. <clears throat> they allocated the pilots uh, an old block of flats or something. It was called a Kremlin. And unfortunately, <clears throat> me and Johnny, Johnny Mongwai, there was no room for us. We were put in a um, house further along the perimeter, you see. And this was a blooming awful place. It was buggy and house bu bed bugs in the place and no windows, no doors. And it was minus 40, you know, and it was very cold. So we thought we're not having that. Now, luckily for us, the chap in charge of transport, the Larry's and whatnot, was a Brummie. And of course, I was a Brummie as well. <clears throat> so we got on like a house on fire and he'd got a, a crate that the Hurricanes had come in. And they're big, they're as big as this house. A crate, a Hurricane crate. Nice thick wood and all that. He, he said, well, you can come and sleep in here if you like. So, that's what we did. Me and Johnny slept in this hurricane crate the rest of the time we were there. It wasn't like living. I mean, I don't think I took my flying jacket off for, for six months, night or day. It was just, when I say it was basic, it was very basic. If you can imagine landing in the North Pole and then with no equipment, what are you going to do? Um, it was, it was, it was basic plus. <laughs> well, you say um, it was minus 40. Can you tell me what the weather conditions were like? What, how they varied? Were the sunny days, were the snow days? I mean, what, what was the weather like and how did you cope with it? <laughs> well, of course, there was a lot of snow and, um, Visibility was down to zero with some of the storms. I flew with a chap called Safanov. Safanov is the Russian, he's like Baydar or Johnny Johnson is here. He's the kingpin of flying in Russia. Grand chap. <clears throat> um, I flew with him quite a few days at times. He was married and had a little son, about three. And um, I'd been back to Russia a dozen times in the last 20 years, 15 years, 20 years. And one of the trips I took my son with me. And uh, they always treated us very, very well, the Russians, though. They've treated us better than they treated the embassy stuff. And they were giving me a party one, the last night before coming home, big banquet, you know. There was all the Russian generals there and 
Met three of our embassy staff, and uh, it was a big do, you know. Um, and I was at the head of the table, and then a chair by me, and my son was on my right side. The chair next to me was empty, and I thought, oh, I wonder why that is. It must be something to do with the Russian protocol or something. Anyway, we all stood and sang the national anthem, etc., and all the rest. And then uh, this chap came in, about 60 now he is, was, a bit more than 60 maybe. And that was this Safarma's son that was three when I was flying with him. He's now like the same age as my son. And uh, they'd gone the trouble to find his son and brought him back to the banquet and he was on my left side and my son was on this right side. And of course the Russian television was there and um, all the media and uh, uh, Safanov's so son was asking me what his dad was like and um, was he a good pilot and all the rest of it. And he's very, very emotional, I tell you. Very emotional, because I, I, I'd got my son there, but he'd got it, hadn't got his dad. And uh, it, 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 that's the sort of thing that the Russians did for us. Can you tell me about Boris Sovanov then? What was, what was Boris Sovanov like? He was a nice chap, um, big chap too, uh, like the Hurricanes. Um, now we started talking about the weather. We wouldn't fly in snowstorms, but so far enough would. We used to think he was crazy, mad, but he'd take off in in a snowstorm and think, oh, we must be mad. But he'd, he'd get there and he'd come back and land. So. Did, they, <laughs> did he socialise with the, the British pilots? A little bit. We weren't allowed to mix with his family or anything like that. But in the we were in dugouts and that, and in the maintenance of the engine, we used to go down and see what they were doing to the engines and that. So far enough would come down and talk things over with us through an interpreter. As a matter of fact, it brings me on to another subject this does. Hurricanes are supposed to have 100 octane petrol, but the Russians flew on 80 octane. And that meant we, the hurricane would cut out at certain heights. And another thing, if you were going into a trouble, you'd always knock your engine into rich mixture like putting your car into bottom gear, I suppose. Something like that. Give you more maneuverability and more response to you. And he would come and eventually they cured this trouble. They, they put a, 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 a catalyst in the petrol, it brought it back up to 100% octane. But uh, I remember Safanov would come along and if we, our lads were, got a uh, carburetor to pieces, because of a big carburetor off of an aircraft, it a great big thing like this. He, he'd tell them to take one float out. There was a couple of floats in. And he'd say, take that float out. Oh, you can't do that. Oh, take it out and let's see. And um, he, he'd do all that sort of thing and he'd fly with this carburetor, what he thought was modified. We didn't know it, but um, that was the sort of chap, you know. Do you remember any of the modifications? Like you were saying about the carburetor, but were there any of the modifications you remember that were made on the hurricane to make it fly better in those conditions? I mean, did it have any difficulties in those conditions? Not the fuel, but the actual, because of the weather and the cold. I don't think there was any, as far as I know. 
No special conditions, no, you know, modifications to it. Um, they had cow, you know, cow. They had to be started up every uh, every twenty minutes or every every half an hour, else they'd never start again because the oil used to go to like lard. It wouldn't uh, it, they couldn't start them again? So night and day, twenty four hours a day, they had to start these. Uh, Hurricanes up every day, every all day, twenty four hours a day. I felt sorry for the ground stuff. It was an awful job, but that's what we did. Young and daft. All right. I read a story about um, they needed some new hangars to be constructed on the base. Yeah. Do you remember how they were constructed and who did it? Well, it was amazing. Um, They had no aids such as diggers or cranes or anything. It was purely a, 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 um, everything had to be done by manual labour. And they wanted to make, <clears throat> you know, um, uh, a dugout so far and then a, a roof put on, a rounded roof, you know. Within about two days, hundreds of these workmen had got these things dug out, pick and shovel, no cranes, and they got them to cover our hurricanes. There used to be thousands on the drone of these. You see, used to see them on the television with big. Packy coats on, you know, big thick packy coats, and they were doing all the maintenance on the drone, uh, you know, filling potholes up, and, and they'd get drunk on vodka at night, and then there used to be a lorry come for them at night, dark, take them away. I don't know where they would take them. But some would get drunk and fall over, and by next morning they were frozen stiff. And they didn't care too hoots, they just used to sling them on a lorry and take them off. And nobody would care, or as far as we knew, they never even asked the names. It was so cheap, labor, life was. So regarding the cold, what, what, um, what happened at night then? I mean, were there any raids on, the, on Vanger at night that you remember? Any bombing, you mean? Yeah. I can't remember any at night. It was nearly always, there was always strafing the drone and Mamansk. Mamansk was a, like a big load of rubble. It was like a sea of Beirut is, you know, all flat, well, knocked down and, um, Yeah. Mommy, were you ever on the base when uh, a bombing raid happened? Yes, many times. Can you tell me about that sort of experience? Can you tell me yeah, what the experience was like? <laughs> well, all you could do, there wasn't much you could do. There was only these little dugout things. There was nothing else there. Uh, and just We pilots had to get in our aircraft as quick as possible. That was the order, get the aircraft off the ground. And that was one of the casualties we had. Um, on one of the raids, um, oh, with a hurricane, on such ground as we'd got, you had to have two men on the tail to hold the tail down. Otherwise it just, you know, with the bug, buggy ground, it just went up onto its nose. And what the drill was, you carried these two men on your tail up to the point of opening up. Then you waited a second till they got off and you took off. Well, this raid was on. We've been strafed and bombed. 
and we were getting off the ground as quick as we could. And uh, one of them, one of the pilots, jumped in. And of course, it was all panicky. It's all very well talking like we are, but it was all. I was going to say panicky, but it, it, it wasn't panicky. Yeah, I suppose it was. He got in and took off and forgot his two lads on the back, on the tail. He took off, got up to about 100 feet, and then he stalled, just stalled down, bang, killed the two lads on the tail. And uh, he was so badly injured, they got him back to England. But I don't think he lived long after that, after he got back. But um, that was, you asked if we were being bombed, and that was, our, that was a, another case. Uh, we were, we were continuing well. I mean, it was only just over, like, talking about Bromsgrove. Uh, I come to have a go at us. But how, what sort of warning did you get on that? Well, I mean, you, you, you know, you're, you're in the morning, you're, you're in bed or you're in the mess or whatever. Was there a, a siren? What, what was the uh, There was no radar, for instance. Uh, no siren, as can I remember. It used to be, there was a thing, a clangor on the, on the drone. But that was the only warning, and that was it. You'd see everybody. There was nowhere to go. We were always in a, in a hot, you know, dispersal point. And if the message came through to there, I don't know where the devil it was coming. Well, I suppose they'd see them coming. <laughs> Our job was get out and get up there. Um, so that was all the warning we had so until they were on the drone bombing us. And at that point, was there any other time when you were actually on the ground or were you always off the ground? Were you always in the air? I was on the ground at times, but we were always run into our aircraft or um, try to get off as quickly as we could. It was the aircraft we were trying to save, not us. And um, it, 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 it was dozens of times they came anyway. I don't know how many, but uh, every nice day they'd be over bombing, strapping. Did you have any near misses? Yes, we did at times. I was trying to think of a specific time. No, I don't think I, there was anything worth mentioning. Um, usually by the time we got airborne, they'd done the bombing and strafing and uh, whatever damage they could do, and they were on their way back home. So we hadn't, we hadn't got much chance of catching them, you know. But well, we did shoot a lot down, by the way. We, we shot, we were um, credited with, um, I think it was about 18 or something like that. And we shot down a lot more than that, but we weren't allowed to um, claim anything if the Russian ground staff had had a pot at it. If the Russian ground staff had had a shot at it, we weren't allowed to claim that. Stalin, he got to put up with us, but we weren't exactly bosom pals, don't forget. We weren't allowed to upset the Russians. A lot of the Russian people liked us. How did they, yeah, okay, so the Russian people liked you. How did you know? I, I'm not being, how did you know they liked you? What, what sort of thing did they do? Well, they were always very generous to us. Um, just for instance, with all this snow, some of the lads were good skiers. 
only asked where we could get skis only. Within a few hours, they'd sent dozens of skis over for us, for anybody that wanted to use them. You know, and that sort of thing. Um, I was just on the edge of the drone one day, and I wanted to go into Murmansk. Russian laddie pulls up, and I said, Murmansk, yeah, okay, jump in. I was saying to Murmansk. But the blooming place was bombed while I was there. And they carted me off to... Um, and it was bloody dangerous because there was Germans amongst the rubble and, and Russians and, and they didn't ask questions. Um, they just shot, you know. We had a card which we had to hold up and share with the English keep a lot. I hope they wouldn't shoot first. And uh, I forget now. Um, oh yeah, they 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 they'd got hold of me in this place. They thought I was. I didn't know who I was. And these two Russian soldiers took me to the commissar, and they gave me a grilling make sure I was English, or he never heard of any English for, at uh, Vyanga. Anyway, he, in the end, he got round to believing us and he, he put me on a, a lorry and took me back to the aerodrome. But that was the sort of thing that um, they'd do for us, you know. They, they were quite good. Well, how did you, between missions, how did you pass the time? Yes. They've gone mad nowadays. All we had was a gramophone. And a gramophone is a thing you wind up with a handle, not electric. And we had a gramophone and 12 records. And then one had to be in charge, wind it up. Well, we played these records. That's all we had. We had nothing else. No radio or television or telephone or anything. The nearest thing you can imagine it would be like would be being dumped on the North Pole with nothing else. And um, I played these, well, we all played these records till they got no bloody grooves in. Ink spots was our favourite. Never heard of them. That's good. Green door, no. Oh, this it's good. Very good. And uh, we played those, but it wouldn't wouldn't be accepted as entertainment these days. But so in the evenings, then you, you had the gramophone, you were listening to music. Um, I know this sounds strange, but did you go? Did you go anywhere on the base? I know you say it was small, but was it a case of don't you weren't allowed out at night, or or what was it? What was you it? wouldn't go out at night. No, couldn't do no. Get your throat cut. Um, well, there was nowhere to go. There was no point in going out. Um, the only places we used to go was uh, the baths. There's some steam baths. So, you know, sauna baths about two or three miles from the from the drone. And they were quite, all wooden, of course, like big sheds. And there used to be this steam coming up and you'd sit there and, and have a... Because you couldn't get undressed to get washed. I mean, you'd be frozen stiff, but... We'd go to these uh, baths when we could, once a fortnight or something like that. And then they had young girls whacking us with uh, birch sticks. They used to chase us round, smacking our bottoms and anything else they could get in touch with.
How, how did they justify that? What was that for? <laughs> <laughs> you move pretty sharpish, I tell you. <laughs> All right, okay, well, uh, let, me, let me talk about uh, a couple of your missions. Do you remember your first mission? I know you say you, fl you flew in without any weapons and you landed. Mm. But do you, do you remember your first mission at, at, at the base? Yeah, first scramble. Can you talk me through it? Can you, yeah, you know, from, if you don't mind, like from how it started to how it ended. Well, it was all very happy. You call it now not very organised, but I know the scramble. I that particular day I was paired up with um, Rook who was one of the officers there, and um, there, was, there was the alarm went, and we took off. Um, met these, could see these 109s just in front. Um, we had a go at them, but I couldn't, I, I never saw any of them burst into flame and come crashing down. Um, You'd give them a burst, and then, uh, of course, they'd be doing every trick in the book then, and they'd get into cloud, and that's the last you'd see of them. And um, if you were lucky, they'd be able to identify the, the uh, crash on the ground somewhere. Somebody, had, one of the natives would ring in and say, They'd seen it, but otherwise you wouldn't really know whether you'd shot anything down. Ebi Ward shot this, um, I think it was an uncle, uncle taking photographs. Now we did see that because that was, um, he shot a 109 down or at least he give it a burst of of, uh, of uh, gunfire, and then he pulled up, and just by luck, when he pulled up, he was right in the sights of this ankle, taking photographs. So we give that a burst, and that disintegrated. That, that went into pieces, but we did see that. But that was the sort of conditions you had. Um, wasn't like saying, seeing one disintegrate in front of you. I never had that anyway. Do you know if you flew the Vic formation or the finger formation? Twos. Twos. Yeah, always had a pair. I normally had uh, Johnny Mulroy with me. We'd swap. I'd be his wingman. Or next day, he'd be my wingman. And I, I know we were talking about scrambles, but on, on the days when you got the aircraft up, how, how many aircraft were in the air, at roughly at the same time? A dozen. Be a dozen from both of us, both squadrons. So there's one. It's quite a formidable. If it was only three or four Messerschmitts, I'd, you know, it was a formidable um, opposition coming at them. All right, okay. this, this is, for me, I, I need to talk to you about this one, but I need as much detail as you can, okay? So it's the mission where you were flying with wags and you saw the tracer going over his wing and it's the mission where you got hit on uh, an enemy aircraft? Well, we'd been scrambled. He'd been strap strapping the drone. Uh, me, uh, Johnny and myself were up there. Um, and we'd just come out of cloud, actually. And just below us, we saw this pair of 109s. So, of course, we, got, we came up behind them, giving a, a burst. Um, I'm sure we hit him because he went all sort of, you know, there's something wrong with his aircraft, that was obvious. 
we got his engine or something. Um, and then we were going to give him another burst, but he, or look or, or not, he went into cloud, which was low cloud, you see. So actually, we thought we thought he wasn't worth bothering. With. Well, you know, it's all done in second. We're doing three hundred mile an hour. You give him a burst, and you passed him then, or he disappeared. It, he got into cloud, so we didn't know. But apparently, we did. We did down him, and he went. Luckily for him, he went into a big mound of snow, which prevented it bursting into flame. And he lived. And when he was with me at uh, Aces High, he was telling me he got out, he was all, all right, but I don't know whether anything was broken or whether his arms were broken or not. And he was telling me they, the Germans sent a little Storch, which was a tiny little thing, land on anything that would. Sent that for him, managed to get him into that, and got him back to the German base. And that saved his life. Now, he was telling me that. And did he, do you know if he continued flying there, or was he sent back to Germany? No. No, he didn't continue flying. He, he was, I don't know what was wrong with him, but he was... I don't know what happened to him, whether he was commissioned out to the Air Force. Well, when you met him did, and talked to him, <coughs> did he tell you about his experience in Germany? Of what happened on that day? Yes, he did. Can you he was, remember? He was telling me how he'd, he'd uh, been strafing us and uh, how he'd, we'd shot him down and... Uh, he, through his interpreter, he was more interested in telling us that the Russians were after him with these pack of dogs. So, uh, when, when you were when you were flying that day, how who do you remember how how you were spotted? Or was it how high? Were you, how what altitude were you at? Were you high up in the air, or were you because you'd been strafing? Were you quite low? What sort of altitude? It was quite low. Low. I would think he'd be about less than 2,000 feet anyway. And he's not very, very high at all. And he, he was, yes, he'd be low on that because he was hugging the ground, sort of. In between one and 2,000 feet anyway. So from your scramble, you managed to get to about 3,000 feet and you saw him below you? 2,000 feet, yeah. Right, OK. So do you remember who saw him? Yes, I did. With Johnny. We were both there, looking down on him. And what do you, what, what do, you do then, what, once you've seen him? I remember saying, <laughs> it's stupid, but when you're in this position... You do stupid things. I remember saying, I flicked the button off the firing button. You better make this good, Carter. I'll see one half be cross. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's a bloody stupid thing to think, but it stuck in my mind. Um, I suppose in my mind, I knew what I was going to do. And I knew there was only one going to come out of it alive. And, and that, that words came into my And those words, for some stupid reason, have stuck in my mind for all these years. Oh, you better make this good, Carter, because he will not be cross <laughs> if you miss. <laughs> so with um, Johnny as your wingman... Done? With Johnny as your wingman... You, you dive down on this aircraft. Um, can you, I mean, can you tell me what what that's like, what it feels like when you know there's an enemy in front of you? For me, it was a horrible feeling. This is what I've been saying all along. 
I don't think in civilian life you can, it's possible to get the feeling that you're just going to finish a man off. It's not natural, well, it ain't natural to me. Um, By this time, going back to uh, Valley, my girlfriend, who was my wife later on, her brother had just been killed over the channel. He'd been shot down in the Blenheim. And the misery and um, heartache it was causing the mother, my wife's mother, um, was something you can't describe, it's dreadful. And you can't help feeling this way when you're gonna kill somebody. He, he, uh, he'd obviously have a mum and dad, and it's not really, mm, I don't know, to me it wasn't natural anyway. Well, it's just, you know, I, what I'm trying to get out there is this, was this the first aircraft that you'd actually got shots at? I mean, close proximity, not, not, I mean, was this the first aircraft that you thought you had a, a chance at? Yet again, no. I think they shot one down with 615. But there again, I don't know what happened to him. He just went, I give him a burst, but that was all. Where was that? Over Valley, in, over, from Valley. It was over Liverpool, that was. And of course, you couldn't do a lot over Liverpool because they had balloons up, you know, and, uh, and Birmingham and Manchester. And these balloons would be about three or four thousand feet with a steel cable on. And if you run into the, you know, if you run past one of those, this wire would cut your wing off just like cutting a piece of cheese off. And um, so it, it was very dangerous to get amongst that lot over a city. You didn't mess about. Um, so that was in hurricanes? You were in a hurricane? Yeah. Can you, I mean, can you, I mean, if you don't mind, cause I, can you tell me about that one as well, That you, what you remember? Well, I can't tell you much more about it because we just give him a, a, a burst of gunfire okay, and he right. disappeared. And um, they used to disappear into Ireland as well if they got half a chance. But I mean, was that another one where you were up at 25,000? No, no, no. I was down around about the 5,000 feet then. And you've been scrambled? Mm. Okay. So We'd, on that one, I'd been in the air then for half an hour. I'd been scrambled an hour before then. And it was just one we, on our two around. That we, I'd been vectored onto them. I'd been vectored um, steer. 360 bandits are on your right and that's how they'd explain it and then you'd be looking and you'd see, see them down below. And were there a lot? There wasn't that day, there was only one. <laughs> I, mean, you, I mean, were you flying alone that day or was it again like a, a pair or four? I never met four. The most I ever met were two. But um, if there was four, you'd be a bit stupid taking them on. Oh, but were you flying with, with the three of you or two of you? As far as the sky was concerned, there was just two of us. There may have been half a dozen in the area, but you wouldn't see them. 
it's a it's a funny business. You were more concerned with your own aircraft and seeing there was nobody on your tail. You know, your eyes would be everywhere. 